Welcome to the June monthly meeting of the Committee on Increasing Diversity in the U.S. Ocean Studies Community. Uh, this is one of a series of monthly meetings where we aim to chip away at the committee's information gathering needs between our larger two-day committee meetings. Um, I'm Kelly Oskwig. I'm a Senior Program Officer for the Ocean Studies Board at the National Academies, and I'm honored to serve as the study director for our new study, Increasing Diversity in the U.S. Ocean Studies Community. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a middle-aged white female with brown hair and glasses broadcasting to you today from the blurred background um, of my home office just outside of D.C. So today we're excited to have Dr. Susan Fisk with us to talk about the 2023 National Academies Report, Advancing Anti-Racism, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in STEM Organizations, Beyond Broadening Participation and specifically to discuss potential application of the report's conclusions and recommendations to our study. Um, and before we jump in, I have a few slides to share to provide some context to those online who may be new to the study or new to the academies. Um, so next slide, please. So for anyone new to the academies, um, we were established by President Lincoln. Um, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, commonly referred to as NASM, are nonprofit organizations with a mission to provide evidence-based, unbiased advice on matters of scientific importance to the nation. We are not government, um, contrary to many's belief. Uh, NASM produces more than 200 reports a year annually, as well as completes a number of other types of activities, um, calling on over 6,000 volunteers, uh, experts a year to help us with all these activities. Um, the work is generally funded by the uh, U.S. government. Some are legislatively mandated, some are commissioned by an agency, and some, like this study, are developed by our own wonderful Ocean Studies Board members. Um, we also work for nonprofit institutions and industry or any organization looking for objective, independent advice. And uh, next slide, please. Let's have a few quick notes, um, quick but important notes on engagement in today's session. Um, the National Academies are committed to the principles of diversity, integrity, civil, civility, and respect in all of our activities, and we look to you to be a partner in this commitment by helping us maintain a professional and cordial environment. Um, and as a committee, we are committed to creating a safe, inclusive space that fosters belonging. Um, we understand that we might not always get it right, um, but we are committed to improving and learning on how to best conduct inclusive meetings, and we welcome your feedback and suggestions. Um, and on that note, I'll ask everyone to please introduce yourself the first time you talk with name, affiliation, and description. Um, please mute yourself when you are not talking so that we can hear clearly. Um, and please use the hand raise function to ask a question. And that goes for committee members or anyone who's joined us online outside the committee. Um, we will uh, have time to take questions from you as well. Um, next slide, please. So quick project overview, um, this consensus study is a 24-month consensus study. It is sponsored by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the Office of Naval Research, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the National Science Foundation. Um, we have a committee of 15 experts um, put together to tackle this um, task, and we have um, basically four hybrid two-day meetings to do so, uh, with an addition to these monthly virtual meetings like we have today. Um, these meetings consist of both open or public sessions, which are really geared towards um, information gathering. So anytime we invite anyone to talk to the committee, the, the meeting is uh, a public meeting. Or, and we also have closed meetings where the committee deliberates and really works on developing their conclusions and recommendations and really progressing the report. Um, so all this work will culminate in a uh, peer-reviewed report that is released to the public in the summer of 2025. Uh, next slide, please. And so what are we even doing? Um, this committee will be undertaking a study to identify evidence-based approaches for systemic change to increase racial, ethnic, and culture diversity and inclusion in the ocean studies workforce. Um, we will do that through, um, through these series of meetings and information gatherings as we're collecting um, existing narratives from ocean prof professionals that represent historically excluded or marginalized groups. We'll be doing a lot of analysis of policy strategies and practices of current, um, currently funded ocean studies programs or programs in STEM to learn what's been successful, um, what's not been successful, and how to measure that. 
um, we'll be developing a coordinated strategy across ocean studies um, that relates to each element of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, accessibility, and justice. Um, and lastly, we'll be identifying uh, metrics to evaluate progress on that strategy. Um, and we'll put a link in the chat if you want to read more. This is an abbreviated version. Um, next slide, please. And this is just a list of the 15 fantastic committee members that we have tackling the statement of task. Um, on that link in the website, um, you can uh, look at their bios if, if you're interested in learning more about any of them. Um, next slide, please. And then I just wanted to give you some important project milestones. Um, so this just kind of goes up from project kickoff, which happened in September of 2023. Um, we've now kind of going down the list, we've gone through our second um, big meeting in Irvine, California. That was early May. Our next big meeting is October. Um, we have a series of these monthly meetings in between. All of this kind of leads to finishing the report um, in the early 2025, going to peer review. Um, and then releasing the publication in the summer of 2025. Uh, next slide, please. And quickly, um, just to, to stay up to date uh, with what the committee is doing and be aware of upcoming events, we encourage you to um, put an email uh, address in this uh, box that you can't really see probably. <laughs> um, but again, we'll put the link in the, in the chat. Um, but please do stay connected with us. Um, and if you also have anything you want to share, you're always welcome to reach out to me and I can share with the committee. Um, next slide, please. And okay, so now to why we're actually here. <laughs> um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Fisk to our meeting. Um, Susan was one of the co-chairs of the report on advancing anti-racism, diversity, equity, inclusion in STEM organizations. Um, she was part of the, the authoring committee and is Emerita Eugene Higgins Professor in the Department of Psychology in Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Thank you so much for joining us, Susan. Um, the virtual floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, I have to speak up a little bit. So if you're having trouble hearing me, let me know. Um, okay, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, how many years have we been doing this? I'm still trying to share my screen. Um, here it is. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe I should introduce myself a little bit more. I've spent my whole career studying diversity and also much of my life living diversity. Um, I identify as a white woman, um, and I use she, her pronouns. Uh, but my whole life has been lived in um, multiracial, multi-ethnic, um, quite varied environments. And so for me, it's kind of a life mission to be a diversity scientist. Um, you might not know what to look at me, and... The first thing I did when I used to teach psychology of racism, of race, was to come into the class with a paper bag full of my cultural baggage. And I would say to the students, you may wonder, who's this white lady teaching this class? Well, here, here are my credentials and my lived experiences that are relevant. Anyway, so um, what I'd like to do today is whet your appetite for reading the report itself, because it's a really, if I say so myself, it was a thorough job and we didn't pull any punches. We said what we believed. And all of the people on the authoring committee have been on diversity committees for their whole lives, professional lives. And we didn't want to be on just another one that said the same old thing that people ignore. So let me give you some highlights. Um, and if you have questions, we'll certainly leave a lot of time for questions. But um, if you have questions that are needed, um, in the moment, just raise your hand. So we have to thank the study sponsors. I, I want to say in the context of this report, we tried to get something like this funded, the Board on Behavioral and Sensory and Cognitive Sciences, and nobody would fund it for the longest time. And then the whole uh, set of issues around Black Lives Matter and the murder of unarmed Black men created the atmosphere in which suddenly the foundations were interested 
And it was really fabulous because we got very generous support. But it does tell you that context matters. The committee members um, consisted of quite a variety of diversity scientists and practitioners. And for many of these people, it was the first time they'd really spent time talking to people who did the other thing. And, you know, the, the people who study diversity science count as scientists. And we, um, we use conventional forms of science for the most part. Surveys, social science, behavioral science, surveys, experiments, observational studies. The people who practice, um, I'm diversity practitioner, it sounds funny, but people who are in administrative positions where they have been either appointed to or taken on the challenge of dealing with diversity in their organization. And we had a wonderful dynamic going on. And Gilda Barabino and I sort of embodied that same kind of practitioner, scientist um, dynamic. We had a great time, actually. But there were times when people had to explain themselves to each other. OK, next slide. Um, so the st the staff, people who staffed it, Dan Weiss was the new board director, Lane Shearer was the person who ran most of it, and then various people came on board, and we were very grateful to them. So this is a, a synopsis of our charge to review the literature on bias and racism in science, um, and it stem with mathematics and medicine involved, um, review approaches to increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion um, in a variety of organizations, and offer some best practices. And notice that we're using the word anti-racism. So that means in the current environment, bring the, the report, anti-racism is active. It's not just avoiding prejudice, it's seeking ways of creating inclusive um, diversity. And so that's quite a different strategy than just letting things happen or not, or, or, or preventing, the, preventing bad things. Um, so we'll come back to this anti-racism idea. Um, we were charged with um, reporting on lived experiences of people who are affected by racism. I'll come back to that. Um, we were charged with identifying ways to change organizational culture, which is really crucial if you're gonna make something stick. Um, and then looking at existing research and advancing, um, using looking at key strategies and then defining a research agenda. So we had quite a full plate and we had to do it in a year. So the Academy reports are getting leaner and meaner. Um, and um, this was no exception. It was a miracle that we got it done in a year. Um, so here's the arc of the report. It starts with historical context, and I'll explain in a minute why that was so important. It gave some realistic data about the demographics of the United States in, a, in racial and ethnic matters. And then we had a chapter on lived experiences, which I'm going to talk about. And then, and then we went from the individual level of analysis to gatekeepers, people who control other people's fate, to teams, to leadership in general, and then where that ends up. So you see that it goes from one-on-one -on -one levels of analysis up to bigger and bigger levels. So, and that was deliberate because these are different systems and each system is embedded in other systems. So here's a picture of it, if you like visual. Um, yeah, so when people talk about systemic racism, they're talking about things that operate at each of these levels and connect the levels as well. We can talk more about specific examples of that. So history. It's really critical that science of diversity operates in the context of the history of, of the diversity in the setting. So, for example, 
um, the whole history of the experience of Black Americans as a group and as individuals and different trajectories. You can't expect things to go away. Bias is not going to go away given the history of Black people in the United States. Not easily. It will eventually change, but you have to look at it in the context. Um, so, oh, I thought, okay, hold on. Um, so most Americans have really terrible training in history, and they don't realize um, how many legal and um, uh, no, how many norms that were established over time that made it impossible to um, make equal opportunity. And these were done deliberately. So, you know, after World War II, for example, when the VA was giving out um, access to education and mortgages, they systematically excluded Black people from um, certain kinds of educational loans. And they systematically um, set up neighborhoods that's too risky to give um, mortgages to. And there just happened to be huge overlap of those risky neighborhoods with where African-Americans were living. Everything follows from that. You can't get a good education if you're in a low resource community. You can't get out and get good jobs. I mean, I mean, everything follows from that. So the history is really crucial to understanding the current standing of different kinds of groups in society. Um, okay, um, oh, so uh, one question I got already was, how do we go about gathering information and writing this chapter? And how do we um, bind this chapter so that it wasn't unwieldy? Well, several of us teach courses in this, and we know sort of what you need to tell people in order for them to get that this is not just a matter of individual people who are biased against other people. It's a whole system standing behind each person that you have to understand in order to understand why uh, things are like they are. So, for example, why aren't there more minority oceanographers? Well, it's not a simple question to answer, um, but I would wager that it has a lot to do with where people live and what resources are available to them and what sciences they get exposed to in school and what their parents consider to be plausible careers. And all these things add up to, I'm sure, a, a dearth of oceanographers who are um, not white people. So, you know, you have to understand that it's a context. You can't just go out and say, everybody should be an oceanographer or people should be friendly to minority oceanographer students. It's, it's just not simple. Okay, um, not to say that we can't tackle it, but so the way we picked the top historical topics to cover was what we needed to cover in order to make a minimal case that this is operating at all levels of analysis and it has to be tackled at all levels of analysis. And that's what we mean by anti-racism. Anti-racism is recognizing that this operates at all different levels and you have to deal with a solution at all levels. Okay, we can talk some more about that um, in the Q&A. Um, okay, so we looked at the demographic composition of the United States. It's famously changing so that it may be um, at some point a minority of white people, European, Anglo, white people. But it's not happening anytime soon. And part of it is it's way more complex than the newspapers cover it as being um, because people intermarry and they're of mixed backgrounds. Um, they learn different languages. Their identities are not simple. To, yeah. Anyway, but there's a general trend that there are more um, non-white races and ethnicities, non-Anglo. Um, but, you know, well, change is, creates hybrid vigor. And, you know, the countries in the world that are not um, dealing with um, immigration, which is one of the big sources of change in the U.S., they have, you know, they have, they're in a sort of demographic death spiral. So these things have 
let me just explain it. It's not really part of the report, but the demographics matter because if you have an aging population where the you know there's not being there's not enough replacement at the younger levels, then there's not enough social security to go around. Um, so that's just like one implication of the demographics and how you treat your immigrants who, who, who disproportionately are young people. Anyway, this is just to say the demographics are not simply cold, dry facts. They're, they have implications. Okay, um, so exploring the lived experience. I'm really proud of this work that we did because National Academies reports don't typically gather data, um, but we decided to be bold and to gather some data to illustrate the lived experience. And social scientists know how to gather data on lived experiences that are um, qualitative but rigorous. So um, I was asked about why the committee chose to focus on Black people in this chapter. The report as a whole focuses on Black people because different ethnicities have different experiences in STEM, but also in in our country and in the world. And if you, we were afraid that if we talked about diversity in the abstract, that that really doesn't address the specific things that happen to different kinds of people in our society. So just to give you an example, um, I study different kinds of diversity, different kinds of groups. And some groups are stereotyped and judged for being not smart enough. Other groups are stereotyped and judged for being too smart. And then other people are judged as being uncooperative or excessively cooperative and obedient. So it's that configuration that where the group is positioned in American society and um, how, how they, have to, what, the stereotypes that they have to fight in order to succeed. So, and the histories are totally different too. And that's one re one thing where, when you see, when you look ex examine the history. So we wanted to do a really good job on one group and then to try to fight to get funding for other groups and tell their story too. So we allude to other people's um, experiences. We allude to other mechanisms, but we don't try, even try to cover it. Um, the 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 task charged to us to cover lived experience came from the um, roundtable of black men and black women in um, STEM. That's a, a part of the academies, and they they keep an eye on things to make sure that um, things that matter to African Americans in, in particular in STEM um, are paid attention to, and so I think. Their concern was that a bunch of people who study this stuff but don't live it would be in charge of the report, and so it wouldn't be realistic about what actually happens on the ground. So um, we decided we would interview some people who are uh, STEM professionals and um, get their examples of their experience of getting coming up through the ranks and, and with a STEM degree. Um, we didn't have much time to collect these data. We didn't have much money to do it either. So we're doing it as kind of a demonstration that it can be done. And we wrote very carefully scripted questions to ask. And we had trained um, research assistants who happened to be diversity students, diversity researchers who um, got their PhDs with me in my lab. Um, so from the point of view of the people who were being interviewed, um, they were interviewed by one of five Black women. Um, some of them were uh, native-born African-Americans and some were children of immigrants. Um, and they, they were asked, have you ever felt like you belonged? Have you ever felt like you didn't belong? And asked to give examples. And so we got really rich interviews. They're fascinating. And we tried to sample them. We have people code them for looking for themes. Anyway, the um, the point is that what it does is it brings the report alive. We were very concerned that we would have a lot of dry statistics, 
which would be devastating in their meaning, but not really absorbed by people. But if you have examples of what, what, it's, what it's like to struggle to get a degree in the face of systemic racism. Um, so here's an example. So this is an example of how it could be that you could be a perfectly qualified, talented, productive person and it wouldn't be recognized. And for people who haven't thought much about this or lived it, there's a kind of, oh, hmm, okay, I can see how that would happen. But before that, it's not real to them. So this is a way of making it real. Um, okay, I, you know, I could talk about this forever, but let's not. Um, one question I got was, we got as a committee was, um, why did you just interview successful people? So we interviewed people who, Black people, who were members of um, the Academy of Sciences and Medicine or Engineering. And the idea was supposed to be that if these people who are so accomplished and recognized experienced all these things, imagine what it's like for the regular person who is not at the top levels. It must be so much worse. So that was kind of to show demonstration. Um, okay, so um, one of the conclusions we came to was that this needs to be continued and expanded. And the report review committee wanted to know what we expected people to do. But we think it was very valuable to be this concrete and to tell stories because people relate to stories, even in science. So if you can pick it, it, demonstrate examples of how this stuff works, what the mechanisms are, it's very useful. Okay. Um, then we're, now we're going into the individual to pairs, to groups, teams, leadership, part of the report. Um, so, I didn't list it. Uh, so this part of the report focused on um, individual lived experience. And um, we weren't primarily focused on this because it seemed obvious that if you experience racism in STEM when you're being trained or in your job, it's it's a bad experience. It'll, it damages everything about being a professional and it makes it super hard. So that seemed to us kind of a given. And so it didn't seem like it needed much proof. Um, the approach was tended to be a little on the clinical side. Okay, um, you can talk more about that if you want. Okay, so now we get to pairs of people responding. We use the word gatekeepers because it's a relatively neutral term for people with power over other people's outcomes. And um, it turns out that when you have power over other people, you're not as dependent on them as they are on you. And people don't necessarily, gatekeepers, power holders, don't necessarily pay attention to their subordinates because the consequences are not so strong if they, if they don't get it right. But if you look at the reverse situation, people who are dependent on a gatekeeper, they spend a lot of time trying to figure out that person and what their motives are and try to predict their behavior because their outcomes depend on them. So this is really a structural situation. And um, yeah, this is just the definition. Um, so gatekeepers are free to pursue their own goals. And it really takes an extraordinary set of consciousness and effort and training for them to think about other people's needs. So the power dynamic encourages people to who have power to neglect people who have less power. It's kind of a cynical thing, but it's what I study. And the data are there from brain imaging of people making sense of other people, not bothering to go for the details if they're power holders, all the way to um, patterns of who finishes and who 
who does well in the field. So we can talk more about that if you want to. Um, so, oh, okay. I'll let you read it. So gatekeepers, because they're in positions of power and they don't need other people as much as other people need them, often react automatically without thinking about it. And so much of the bias in organizations is unthinking bias, relatively automatic. It's not that people sit there and say, how can I get more people who look like me into the organization? It's just they don't think about it. They just make decisions and pick people who look like them because they're more comfortable doing that. So this means that the gatekeepers themselves are not going to be good sources of insight into when they're making biased decisions. And if these things are unconscious and automatic, that means that you have to look at the pattern over time of any given decision maker's decision. So there may be one, say, white person who is a manager who picks a variety of people over time. But there may be another person who always seems to pick people from their own university or to similar places, and they're all they all resemble the decision maker. So you can only know that by looking at what people are doing over time, and then giving them feedback and um, and other other recommendations. We suggested that they should be reinforced or rewarded for for being able to nurture and recruit a variety of people as subordinates and help them with their careers. So um, anyway, this is, so the point is that you have to look at organizational level information systems. You can't just ask individual people, oh, you know, are you in favor of diversity? Because it, it won't work. OK, suppose you do get diverse teams. Um, there's a dynamic in the teams, too, by who has what identity and how they are seen in a society and how they're seen and treated in the organization itself. Um, but under ideal conditions, these diverse teams can produce really fabulous outcomes because people bring different strengths and different goals to the interactions. Um, and also, the single best way to overcome bias is for people to have interdependent experiences with people who are different from them because then they need each other and they have to make sense of each other if they want to get promoted and succeed. And so that kind of, it's called the contact hypothesis. It's been studied for 50 years and interdependence is the key feature. That is people who need other people to get what they want. It seems very I don't know, maybe overly pragmatic that you have to make people's outcomes depend on other people, but that's how it works. Okay, so recommendation from chapter seven, interdependent teams. People have to feel psychologically safe. That is, they have to feel equal status in the setting. Um, and there has to be trust, which is really hard to establish and really easy to destroy. Um, part of feeling psychologically safe is not just having one person on a team who is different from other people. You have, you have to have a variety. Okay, um, moving right along because I want to give you a chance to do Q&A. So leadership is really crucial. If you have um, an, uh, a pressure or organizational goal of diversity, but the leader says, nah, it's not our number one priority. Everything will, fall, will fail. If the leader says, this is important to our mission, it's part of who we are, it's part of our identity, it's part of our effectiveness, it's the right thing to do. And I'm going to also evaluate you on the basis of your ability to get with the, get with the mission. Then the leadership is really able to make some changes. And they're, what they're doing is creating an organizational culture. So the norms can either identify this as a multicultural 
accepting, inclusive, um, anti-racist organization, or it can do the opposite on any of those. Okay. Um, so basically, this is um, telling us to gather data about the patterns of recruitment and at different stages and be proactive about outreach. Okay, um, research agenda. Well, this is not a single set of goals that you can, you know, it's not simple and it's not also going to be one and done. You can't do a single intervention and then say, well, we did that already. Um, you have to come at it from all different angles, from all different levels of analysis. And you have to have organizational structures that um, that keep an eye on what's going on. So if you say, oh, well, we all agree, we're going to look for more diverse job candidates and leave it to be at that. If nobody's keeping track. Nobody's monitoring it. It's not going to happen might happen for a year, but then after that, it won't happen. So people have to be accountable. There have to be um, structures in place that keep track, monitor the information, and look at the trends over time. Because the reason that um, biased decision-making is so prevalent is that it's the easy way to do things. I'll pick somebody who reminds me of my younger self. I know they'll succeed. People are comfortable with that, and they don't question it. And even if they learn not, learn not to do it one year, their proclivity will make them go back to the old way of doing things. So the price of freedom is um, constant vigilance. Okay. Um, I mean, happy to take questions. Um, Thank you so much, Susan. Um, if anyone has questions, uh, if you raise your hand, I'll take them in the order of the hands raised. Um, Christina. Yeah, hello. Hi. Hi. I'm Christina Ravello. I'm at UC Santa Cruz. And um, uh, I've been in various positions having to do with DEI, and I'm um, going to be the director of the Institute for Marine Sciences here. So I have a question about, um, and I'm, I'm a woman of color that's an oceanographer. And <clears throat> I, I, you know, in oceanography, as well as a lot of field sciences, and also you can think about medicine too, right? Part of what we do is we learn how to pick the questions that we work on. And I was wondering if your committee grappled at all with, um, with kind of, um, you know, sort of how academia are gatekeepers of the scientific questions that get asked and that we're trained to do that, right? So we don't, it's in, I, you know, I feel like what we do in oceanography a lot is what I would say like helicopter science. We go to all kinds of places, like different countries, different regions, and we mm -hmm. come in and we do the work and then we leave. And there's, and there isn't, we don't really, we're not really trained in community engaged science where we're really, um, we're really engaging with the community um, to help ask the questions and help uh, um, answer the questions that we're, that we're asking. So we just sort of, we get to define who that is, who, right. what the questions are. And do you, you know what I'm talking about? So I'm just wondering if you, if you, you didn't mention anything in your presentation about sort of that aspect. So it's, it's it's about um, about how science might change to be more responsible to divert to the diverse diverse communities. Yeah, is that something you talked that you talked about in the report? Not not much, um, but I think it's really clear that who does the science determines what questions are considered interesting, 
how they're done, um, who they're done on in aid of. Um, and uh, so it's important. I mean, the, the diversity of the science is important just to improve the science and look at it from different points of view. And then in your case, um, as you say, the helicopter scientist, um, it really does matter how you treat the the locale where you are, the people. Um, and I would think there might be some collaborations with anthropologists. You know. I, I think it's not a practice that we, I mean, I, I you know, I, I somehow made it in academia as a person of color and I, I don't, and I, and I feel like the way I do science and define the questions is pretty, pretty much taught to me by, yeah. by the academy, right? By, by uh, my mentors, let's say. And, and, it, and it's hard to break away from that. And that, I just, I'm, it just seems like something that we have mm -hmm. to think about actually, like, how do we, do science differently um, mm -hmm. and not just and i don't think just i think that being inclusive certainly in the academy is a, is a great step but it seems like like it would be it would be great to think more about about yeah. um yes. more about how to do community engaged actually um, community engaged science one thing you need is a critical mass you can't have one person out of 30 who is of a particular persuasion and you know it's very dangerous for them to speak out all the time. So you need to have enough people that there's psychological safety for people who are different from the norm. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, the next question is Steve Diggs. Hi, i um, Steve Diggs. Um, I work for the University of California Office of the President. Before that, I was an engineer at Scripps Institution of Oceanography for 30 years. And I um, want to make two points. Um, I think one is immediate, and that is oceanography is not just um, academics who have PhDs, but it takes ship crew, engineers like myself and other people who can have very rewarding careers and help change the face of oceanography. Oftentimes, um, it wasn't my boss who would go and give talks in schools where um, most University of California people don't show up. It was me. And so I ended up representing and being the face of things. And how do you engage people who want to go in and make things and be a part of oceanography and climate science? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. I mean, and I think that many of the reports skip over that and only focus, um, have a very narrow focus when it comes to um, where the actual change takes place. And that leads me to my second point, less of a question, more of a statement, which is we don't start early enough. That mm -hmm. I think that everybody knows that we watch countries around the world who plan decades out mm -hmm. to make changes and start when people, um, when our perspective scientists um, before they ever set foot in a classroom um, mm -hmm. in the school level. And if we focus there, I think as anybody knows who navigates a ship or any kind of vessel, being on course early beats being on course late. And when we try to shift the narrative when people already have a PhD or already in graduate school mm -hmm. or even already in, in undergraduates, in many ways it's too late. It's very difficult to get people to change their trajectory um, after they're 18 years old. And so... I'm, <clears throat> I would love to see the National Academies focus on where it can make the most impact. And that is starting as early as possible um, and making real change. And it actually costs a lot less. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really important. And there is a report actually that takes the, the life stage just prior to our report and looks at STEM in, um, in, high school and um, elementary school. Um, yeah, I totally agree with you. And it makes sense from a structural point of view that if kids are not exposed to the possibility of being an oceanographer or any other kind of scientist at a young age, they don't have the experiences and the role models and the early tools that they need. I want to go back to what the previous uh 
uh, person said, uh, the lady who's a person of color who's an oceanographer at the university and is an academic, uh, she almost made my point for me, which is changing science is hard. Mm -hmm. You know, once you bought into what you need to do to get tenure, what you need to do to maintain and publish, it's very hard to do something that paints outside the lines. And so, I mean, they just, it, I mean, I think you could ask to a person how easy is it to change once your early career, um, it's very difficult. And maybe at the end of your career, when you have a lot more influence, you can make substantive changes. I, I will say, because I'm an incurable optimist, that if you really believe in an idea that, that you happen to notice because of your position in society, and other people haven't thought of it, it's very hard to get it published. But if you get it published, it will be the most cited thing you ever wrote. So um, my own experience was that it was important to have different kinds of people and because they would think of different ideas. They were really hard because to get published because they were not normal science. But the other, then the downside is that it may be devalued because it comes from a particular point of view. But, but in the best case, if you have the right um, credentials and the right to methods and tools and you're persistent as hell, you know, and you won't let them turn you down um, you can have an impact by these precise mechanisms of being a different way of thinking. Um, but let's go to the next person. Thank you, Claudia. So I'm Claudia Benitez Nelson. I'm a PhD scientist and oceanographer. Um, I'm also chair of the Ocean Studies Board. I will just acknowledge who, who I am um, and have been very interested and a, a big, a strong proponent of this particular um, work that's happening. Um, I guess I'll turn it around and say, as someone who is currently a, a senior associate dean in a college of arts and sciences, so quite large, um, I know that we've been doing a lot of things institutionally to, to really think about how we diversify across our fields, but particularly in, in the ocean sciences. And I guess my question for you is, you know, how have you explored and thought about that now that there are actually individuals who are at those higher level positions who can institute change? I think Christine is in the same boat. You know, are there um, best practices and thoughts from your perspective based on the work that you've done that um, that can be effective at at our kind of at, at our level? And I will preface this by saying that I agree that early intervention is always you know, preferred, sooner you can get someone in and interested and excited is great. But I'm also very much interested in retention. I have a number of students, not just at my university, at the University of South Carolina, but across, who start very strong as undergraduates and freshmen who are um, students of color, students from diverse backgrounds, who, who decide to leave the field for a variety of reasons, many because they've had some um, poor experiences, rather from it's a parachute science to they've been treated poorly to they've been told the only mechanism or, or way to be successful is to get a PhD um, and to do research. So in that context, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what your thoughts are from a, a larger scale administrative component. Well, I think uh, there are so many. It's a very rich question. Um, just some illustrative examples. Um, I think building in um, aff affiliations, small group affiliations at each stage, it supports people, makes them feel like they belong. So I'm not talking about you put all the Latino kids in one group or you put all the African-Americans in one group. There, There's place and time for that kind of thing, but it's not the study group for the exam. And um, first of all, you tell everybody there are study groups you should be in one because not everybody knows that they don't have the, they weren't socialized to know that they should be studying in groups um, or there are practice exams and you should use them to study. Um, but if you put people in mixed groups where different people have different strengths and um, if they all take the test together and then they have to help each other get better scores the next time. Um, that kind of interdependence. And it, it, the keys are that people have personal ties to each other because they're working together so hard. 
and that everybody has something to offer. So that kind of mechanism can really help. Um, and mentors of all different persuasions too. You don't have to match people demographically to their mentor. It helps to have somebody who might be like you, but also people who are, are genuinely interested. So these can are some speak, ways. Yeah. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the larger scale, maybe institutional kinds of constructs that might be useful in breaking down barriers. So yeah. Um, yeah. An example you were about to say. So, for example, um, anything from um, acknowledging how to how to acknowledge service or how to acknowledge um, work that is done primarily by my underrepresented faculty and whatever you want, you know, first gen faculty of color um, who disproportionately do work when it comes to outreach or education or engagement, you know. Are there are there best practices? Are there ways to acknowledge that work more um, holistically for for those faculty who engage in those ways? Well, I think you have to keep track of the patterns, and if if you have all your faculty of color are doing all the mentoring of minority students, that's an added burden, and there has to be a compensation in for that. Some kind of recognition that that takes time out of their day and it cuts into their bandwidth for, for research. Um, and you also have to, if there are patterns of things that underrepresented groups tend to do, um, you have to look at the compensation they're getting as well. So in every field, there are topics that women tend to do. And in every field, if that gets to be too salient, then that, the pay, pay grade for that goes down. Um, and I think a combination of information that people don't get, like, oh, you're supposed to argue for um, your accomplishments. And if you feel like you're not being recognized sufficiently and you have good reason to believe that you're right, then you need to make a case to your chair or your dean or your personnel committee. The idea that you are entitled to do that is news to some people. So I think a lot of it is information, just what the norms are not knowing that you can make an argument for things, not knowing that you can say, if you're given another service assignment, well, I can do this if you want, but I have to stop doing something else. You can bargain for these things. Um, service by and large is not portable. There's research is. Um, so I think, I think a, a bit of thought and planning um, as to, in particular, the knowledge that people have and the rewards that they get for what they do. Thank you. Thanks. Thank it's not you. easy. Um, uh, I saw I saw Jean Tan go down. She was next. Jean, do you want to go ahead and ask? Uh, um, this is Jean May Brad. I'm retired from the Louisiana Department of Education. I identify as a white female. My pronouns are she and her. First of all, thank you very much for the introduction to the study. I greatly appreciate your time and the things you've shared. And I jump back to what Steve brought up a little while ago, and that is the idea of beginning early. But I wonder if you found things as far as gatekeepers or leadership that really has to be addressed in our K-12 arena. As you said, one of the problems is, you know, finding out what kind of exposure students had in school to the ocean sciences perhaps is a problem. But even more yesterday in her message on the state of the science, Marcia pointed out that we have 7,000 students dropping out of high school every single week. And that kind of number is frightening because to me as a K-12 educator, that's talent pool that is never even getting into organization or structures. So somewhere, whether it's school boards or school leadership, um, did your study do anything looking at that kind of situation in the, in the field? Um, or is that one of those to be continued aspects? And I appreciate your time and your answer. Thank you. It's it's really important question. Unfortunately, we did not address it because we dealt with um, sort of BA plus. So, but there are there was another report being done at the same exact time, focusing on 
um, college and pre-college STEM experiences with inclusion and diversity. So you'd have to go to that report to get a really good um, answer to your question. I won't even try to make up one. Thank you. Um, Nancy? Hi, I'm Nancy Knowlton. Uh, I identify as a white female. I'm a retired marine scientist from the Smithsonian. I was, well, first of all, I wanted to thank you for the report. It's going to make our job a lot easier having the groundwork, that, the amazing groundwork that you've laid in this report. I'm just wondering what you feel the reception to the report has been since its publication. I realize it's not that long ago, but, and also if there are things that either um, members of the committee or the National Academies of Science are doing to amplify the impact of the report after its publication. Yeah, we spent almost as much money on the dissemination activities as we did on writing the report. And this is, uh, like it's, it, I'm, I've spent the last year on the road, either physically or electronically and Gilda too, and a lot of the other staff. Um, so we we really made a systematic effort to disseminate it. Um, I think the biggest um, recommendation I have to people is to form a book group and read a chapter or two a week and meet with people and talk about it because it's those conversations that enable these things to move forward. And um, I think discussing the recommendations and disagreeing with them if necessary, um, you know, I think all that will increase the impact of the report. I will say that the number of downloads of this report were very high, extremely high. So um, a lot of people are downloading it, but um, the atmosphere in the country changed after we published it. So when we were publishing it, the arc of justice was bending in a way that was consistent with what the report was advocating. Um, but then things started to move away from enthusiasm for diversity, quite the contrary. So um, the challenge is um, to find ways of valuing what we've all been saying diversity has to offer to the science it makes it a better science and trying to promote those outcomes, I think. Um, there's there's data that show that um, if you argue for um, the inclusion of a variety of people on the basis of values, it's the right thing to do, it's fair. Um, people who are underrepresented tend to appreciate that. If you argue for it on the basis of pragmatism, we don't have enough engineers, so we have to grow them. We can't just import them. Um, then um, that argument sits better with majority people. So both kinds of argument need to be explored in order to persuade people who are gatekeepers. Um, I won't pretend it's easy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did see some hands that went down, um, probably because they thought we didn't have enough time. Um, if if you were one of those folks, um, Ken, I'm, I don't want to point you out, but if, if you still wanted to ask a question, we have one minute. Um, we could squeeze it in. No, actually, Nancy asked, asked my exact question, okay. so it was covered. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, all right. So, and now it's four o'clock. Um, and the East Coast. Um, I want to take this time to thank Susan for sharing her insights from the report with us. Um, I think this was very useful for the committee. Um, and I imagine there might be a few more uh, questions that come up. So I hope you don't mind if we just reach out to you via email, sure. um, if we have any other follow up. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Um, Susan was supposed to join our, I think our April meeting, but there's a snowstorm. So we appreciate your flexibility and rescheduling um, and, and sharing your time with us. So, so thank you very much. Um, this will then conclude the, um, the I mean, public I mean, session. I mean, and I mean, so, uh, if, oh, go ahead. 
Um, if people are going to um, convey questions, it would be easier if I got them in a clump. Okay. Got so it. Thank maybe you. collect them. Um, yes, we'll do that. Um, thank you so much. Sure. Well, um, so this will conclude our public session. Um, if you're a committee member, you have a, a link to our closed session and so just log off from this one and then we'll log back on to our, our normal committee meeting. So thanks so much for every, to everyone for joining us um, and have a good rest of your day.